So, I am so happy that Dr. Uh, Erica Mallory Blythe is here. She is a joy and such a wonderful human on the planet. Um, she's also a UK trained medical doctor with a decade of experience um, of various kinds in hospital medicine. She's an emergency trauma medicine specialist, that's her area of expertise. Uh, she has a broad base of medical experience, including surgery, anesthesiology, obstetrics, pediatrics, and intensive care, both neonatal and adult intensive care. She's worked in hospital emergency rooms, led to trauma. She's led trauma teams, taught on trauma medicine courses throughout the UK and abroad, and was selected to instruct doctors on teaching within medicine for advanced trauma and life support. However, that's not why she's here, as you can imagine. In 2008, she began researching the biological effects of non-ionizing radiation, which included a copious literature appraisal and conducting her own research, including provocation testing of those with electromagnetic hypersensitivity, right? So now it gets more interesting. She has provided expert witness testimony regarding AHS and been invited to discuss the public health concerns of non-ionizing radiation exposure at the highest political level both in the UK and the EU. So she formally transitioned from clinical medicine to full-time research in 2015 and continues to advise where appropriate and necessary, given the task of providing such support for ever-growing numbers is escalating. She found it, since it was, she founded FIRE, which as you can see on her slide here, she is the founder of Physicians Health Initiative for Radiation and Environment to facilitate education on a larger scale. So you'll see in other doctors' bios that they are members of FIRE here in the United States as well as abroad. The group has international affiliations with medical doctors abroad and is currently constructing best practice guidelines for electromagnetic radiation health for multiple settings on our website if you go to the resource section, we have tried to compile a list of uh, many things, including resources for literature, uh, and FIRE is certainly an amazing resource for physicians. So I will not read her extremely long level of membership, um, <laughs> of, of memberships that she has in different organizations, but um, she's also a trustee for radiation research. She's a medical advisor for Oceana Radio Frequency Advisory Association, uh, the International Guidelines for Non-Ionizing Radiation, and a medical advisor for electrosensitivity. But the most important part is that she's going to teach us how to actually assess, diagnose, and treat electrohypersensitivity. And her slides are incredible if you haven't already seen them. So, Dr. Mallory Blythe, please, please welcome her. That is, that is your water. So just backwards and forwards. Great, thank you. Good. Thank you so much for such a thorough introduction. And firstly, as with the others, I'd like to just say um, deepest gratitude to the visionary um, Dr. William Ray. And... It's, um, it's with great honor that I've joined global experts here today. Ah, shall I move this a little? Let's make it a bit higher. Does it, how does it come out? It's an IQ test that I just failed. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Goldilocks, did lot, she did not like her porridge too hot. Nor could she bear it too cold, because she's a sensitive soul that needs it to be just right. And so her name has been given to the circumstellar habitable zone, which is this fragile, thin shell around a sun where life as we know it can flourish. And even within that thin zone, there's only one planet we know of in our Goldilocks zone which can be called a Goldilocks planet, which has this careful balance where everything is just right. And it's no secret that we are pushing that Goldilocks zone until it's no longer just right. Our porridge is becoming too hot. And it's not only, climate change isn't only one element. It's not only a temperature thing, as everybody knows, I think. But arguably one of the most profound changes that we've seen in human history is to our electromagnetic environment. 
So, as mentioned earlier, radio frequency fields can be found in intensities now that are a billion, billion, a quintillion times higher than natural background radiation, which you'll see here in green, and you'll see how it dips in uh, the sort of gigahertz region, which is the very region that we have filled in with anthropogenic or man-made RF fields. So this is to remind me to say, if you guys want to join FIRE or get more resources, um, well, there's no membership fee, anyone can join, and they can join through the site, which is firemedical.org. So I want to set the scene, and, and actually that's been brilliantly done by the experts who spoke before me, so thank, huge thank you to them. But just some really quick, fast facts to recap on some points about non-ionizing radiation. And in this point, uh, for this slide, I've chosen to speak about radio frequency because it's one of the ones that's escalating so fast. I agree with the, uh, one of the previous speakers who pointed out that all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum interact with biology, all aspects, which is, is there's still an outdated dogma that non-ionizing radi radiation does not. You've seen today that's not the case and there's a lot more evidence than we can present in any one day. But RF damages biology at what we call non-thermal or very low intensity exposures, which are way below current guidelines. The WHO categorized this a long time ago in 2011 as a group 2B carcinogen, but recently that evidence has elevated with two very large-scale animal studies, so many are calling for this to be a group 2A or a group 1 known human carcinogen, and we're waiting for that re-evaluation to take place. It's been designated high priority. Mechanisms are probably numerous and their multiple pathways are likely, but oxidative stress is very strong in the scientific literature. So I'm really delighted that this has come up, I think, in every single talk that you've heard today. And it, it will be resurrected in mine. Multiple endpoints are what we expect from an oxidative stress mediated damage. And that's certainly what we're seeing. And EHS is just one of those endpoints that I think dovetails in with many other processes. We talked about the fact that current safety limits are not protective, and the ICNRP guidelines were designed to protect against short thermal exposures only. And one, this is a bit of a take home message. Biological disruption is not linearly proportional, either to intensity or to frequency. So please do remember that. And when we say distance is your friend, broadly speaking, I totally agree with that. We, we need to be reducing intensities. However, if we're going to be purist about it, um, there are these intensity windows that can be very, very low where there's enhanced biological activity. And human bodies, as well as all the other life on the planet, developed various forms of sensory systems to optimize their longevity and existence. And uh, you're, you're a medical audience, you know of the five senses and the others that we are blessed with as humans. Um, but there is some in the an animal kingdom that we kind of aspire to that we sometimes call super senses. And animals uh, often use electroreception and magnetoception to help them with various skills to, again, improve their survival and optimize um, their living. And many of these uh, organelles and vestigial components of their apparatus can be found in the human body. And this may seem like a sudden divergence, but there is method in my madness. I want to mention for a moment the Mokan tribe, who are sometimes known as sea gypsies. And they live off the West High Coast and have adapted their physiology to their environment in the way that we often see in evolutionary terms. But this is not evolutional. This is an adaptive change. So they need to forage on the sea floor for their food. Th these guys can often swim before they can walk because they literally live on the ocean. And if you guys were to dive into the water, then you would naturally have a pupillary dilatation to allow more light into your eye in those low light conditions. That's not what happens to the Mokan tribe. Their pupil constricts, which allows them to forage on the seafloor. It allows them fine point discrimination underwater, which for them is really important. That's how they gather food. And the reason I bring this up is this is not an evolutionary change, as I mentioned. You can take European children, put them in a swimming pool, and over and over again get them to do fine motor tasks, and they develop the same involuntary adaptive state. So this is... Uh, this is showing how the human body can, in a short period of time, adapt to a new environment to optimize how to cope with that environment. So I think this raises a question in the context of why I'm here today. 
is electromagnetic sensing useful to humans? And I think in context of the fact that this is currently a potential human carcinogen, and we've seen evidence of lots of different disease endpoints which are linked. And we've got to a point where I, I had a conference in London last year, and I asked my panel of experts, we all voted, have we reached a tipping point in terms of saying undeniably, electromagnetic fields currently used below safety guidelines are causing damage to biology. And there was a unanimous agreement that was true. So in that world, is it useful to sense? And one could say it's a bit like being able to smell asbestos. That's kind of useful, isn't it? So this raises another question. How, how do we look at this process? Is it a sickness, or could it be considered as a type of super sense or extended sense? Now, I realize in my capacity as a medical doctor and in terms of why I've been invited here today, I think we need to focus on seeing some of the potentially harmful elements of this and how we can optimize people to protect them. But I, I don't want the other side of that coin to be forgotten, and that's why I introduced it near the beginning, and we'll touch upon that again at the end. Electromagnetic hypersensitivity is known under many different names. And I choose this one generally when I'm speaking um, because medically it fits with the way I was trained and the nomenclature we use medically. But it must be differentiated from electromagnetic sensitivity. So it's the introduction of this word hyper. El all life forms are electromagnetically sensitive, all of them. And there is probably, and I'm guessing here because we don't have particularly strong evidence on this, but maybe a bell-shaped curve in terms of the span of that sensitivity. It's a grey transition. There's not a sudden leap um, from insensitive to sensitive. And I use the term electromagnetic hypersensitivity with that word hyper, like we use in hypertension, to mean outside of the normal range where it's really become in destructive and interfering with life. And I've given this condition a definition that I use as a working definition. A multi-systemic condition characterized by increasing sensitivity to electromagnetic fields of increasingly broader frequency ranges at lower and lower intensities. And anyone feel free, if I say anything that people go, can you clarify that, please interrupt me and I will immediately. But there'll be a, pa a panel question time at the end as well. I hope that's reasonably clear. And I want to make a statement, and this can be a whole lecture in itself. EHS is a physical condition at its origin, not a psychological one. And I have done whole lectures explaining the evidence base for that. But again, we can cover that in question time if we need to. But I want to get in the, the point. I, I decided the, most, the way I could be most useful to you as a group, as health practitioners, is to try and give you a toolbox that is as simple as possible, that you can literally carry away and immediately use within your practices. So let's talk about the practical applications of that. Symptoms to look out for. The common symptoms with this are insomnia, headaches, um, sometimes a pressure sense in the head or the ears, tinnitus, cardiac palpitations, dizziness. That sounds like a lot just off the top of my head, and those are common ones. Of course, they're in every system. That is exactly what we would expect from a radiation-induced illness that affects multiple cell types in multiple systems. But in this long list of multi-systemic issues, I've put asterisks by a few of the ones that I've noticed are a bit more unusual that might red flag you that this, if somebody hasn't identified themselves that they think they have AHS, this might help you wonder. Very sharp pains sometimes, especially through the ear or in the head. Um, uh, sometimes a sense of vibration and sometimes you actually see a, a tremor but sometimes there's nothing to see but people feel a sense of vibration like a beehive buzzing almost that's very much within. Um, electric shocks and again sometimes they just f sensing electric shocks sometimes their family and friends will say they, they are discharging shocks all the time and they can actually be seen in daylight as a, as a bright snap so there's a lot more of that happening. Um, increased chemical sensitivity, we've touched on this many times today, and absolutely this appears to be linked, um, and usually there, even if it's on a, a relatively low level. And in keeping with that, a total upregulation of the sensory system in general, and some of the visual effects that can come in with this are really fascinating. Um, I, I wish I could go into more detail, but if anyone wants to talk to me about that at the end, there are some hallmark visual signs that I consider quite unusual, and of um, and fit with um, a scotopic sensitivity syndrome a little, if people are familiar with that. Um, 
Another interesting pattern I've noticed is that if this is unmanaged, if people aren't able to reduce their EMF exposure, they will collect symptoms over time. And when they become managed, they, those symptoms will disappear in the reverse order that they were accumulated. And they make, there's some, some physiological sense in that, um, a bit like neural retraining. The pathways that are most deeply cut are the ones that are most difficult to shift, perhaps. Circadian rhythm reversal is a real problem, especially in later stages of EHS, which must be treated in order to successfully improve health. I would be sad if anyone walks out of here thinking that EHS is some incredibly marginal condition that affects a tiny proportion of the population. I don't believe that's true. I think, as I said earlier, that this is a grey spectrum. And of course, we have some people, all environmental uh, stresses or toxins or changes even, will have a spectrum of sensitivity. And we see EHS, even when it's not called that, over and over again in studies. And this just happens to be one which showed a dose-response effect of the same constellation of symptoms we see in EHS in a dose-response fashion, depending on how close you live to a mobile phone base station. But there are many, many studies now, including how intensively people use their mobile phones or occupational exposures, so showing the same things over and over again. Now, there's an issue in England which I think may well affect you here in the US as well which is that if a person goes to their family practitioner and says, I think I have this condition, they might do a little bit of looking up on the internet and go, aha, I know what your problem is. You're frightened of your cell phone and it's giving you a headache because you're scared of it. And that's something called the nocebo response. Um, it is a real scientific phenomenon in that technically someone can be so uh, have such anxiety connected with an exposure that it could induce real symptoms that are based on a psychological reaction. That is not the cause of EHS. And again, I could explain the evidence base for that, but we don't have time today. What I will say is that although it's not the cause of EHS, electromagnetic fields are the cause of EHS, it can play a role later on down the line in EHS, as we would predict, and as can happen in many other illness processes. And I'll just leave that there because I might touch back on that when we talk about management. And one of the best ways to prove that fear is not affecting, as well as uh, uh, Professor Johansson talks about animal studies earlier, which I think is an excellent way. He's quite right. The mice that are being used, the insects, they're not reading newspapers. But in addition to that, um, provocation studies where a person is double-blinded and they're exposed to an ele electromagnetic field and they have a, a a genuine physical reaction to that, whether it's objective or subjective, as long as that's double-blind, that obviously excludes any causative role for a psychological process. And there have been double-blinded provocations of this type that have been successful in demonstrated that. And the truth is, scientifically, you're supposed to only need one of those to where you've proven, you falsified the theory of the nocebo effect. Now, we like a lot more than one, but one is the Karl Popper principle. It's the black swan theory. That's technically all we need. But we've got a lot more evidence than that. Um, I, I can't talk about etiology today in our short time, but I just want to briefly say, because it affects management, that there is likely to be some predisposition, and there are a lot of different elements that feed into that. And then there is a trigger, and that can be either a chronic slow trigger or an acute single trigger. And it doesn't have to be EMF. I agree with Professor Belpom when he said this. It can be a body stress that can include, uh, especially with a, a very acute stress or a chemical, for example, um, something that severely stresses the organism will cause this sensory upregulation. And um, interestingly, and I just want to drop this out there, um, the other place I think we see this is in pregnancy. Now, in pregnancy, your body changes to be very defensive for different reasons, but it's being defensive, and you see general sensory upregulation. And I think that deserves some investigation um, beyond the scope of this talk. But So the trigger needs to be a stressful or toxic exposure. Now, maintenance, if we're going to call this EHS, maintenance does have to be an electromagnetic field reaction if we're calling it electromagnetic hypersensitivity. If it's chemicals, we would call it MCS. Usually, we find that patients have both occurring together. Now, diagnosis, the kind of meat of what I wanted to get into and, and talk about with you. I'm trying to make this really practical so that people who aren't necessarily specialists in environmental medicine can diagnose and begin to manage this condition because I think that's essential to moving forward and totally achievable and practical. 
We use a term in England uh, called a clinical diagnosis. Can you just tell me, do you understand that term in the US? So it means a diagnosis based on history and examination alone. No fancy adjuncts, no fancy tests, just history and examination. Um, that is what this is currently, and it's what it should be. So the bulk of your diagnosis is on your history. So you need to take a good one. In, in England, we, um, we have a system where GPs often have uh, two to five minutes, family practitioners, to see a patient take a history. That's not going to work. So um, you need to take a proper detailed history. And I flashed this up. I, please don't, don't try and really read any of my slides, but particularly not this one. It's just to show you that these are the direct questions that I ask if I'm taking a history from someone with EHS. Of course, you start the way you normally would. You let them tell their story, and you write that in detail. But then there'll be loads of stuff they won't have thought of to tell you, and you have a long list of direct questions. And I'm going to go ahead and pull these together in a package that I'll put on my FIRE website to make this easier for people to think of what they might want to ask. But I'm just going to pull one, one page out of that set that I've got. This is something I've been calling a device chart, which is where I... Sometimes you'll find that some people with the HS have a different constellation of reactions to different types of exposure, and they won't be able to tell you what the frequency or the intensity is. They'll tell you what the device or the location is. So in the top, I write the device or the location, and I let them tell me what they're feeling, and I record it all in this chart so it's really quick and easy. So this is a fast way of, t of shortening your history time. And to bring out a few key points, um, it's really useful to have someone bring in, uh, do a history uh, diary at home of their, of their symptoms so they don't forget because it can be very complex. Um, note that there'll be a wide range of severity. So you'll see some patients who have this very, very mildly and they won't necessarily have identified triggers and some on the other hand who are utterly debilitated. Um, I've mentioned some of the unusual symptoms so you can look for those that might help you to work out if that's playing a role. Um, also, as well as devices and locations as triggers, um, some people will report, or you can ask this on direct questioning, about a thunder, thunderstorm prodrome. I mean, this is documented historically very well in scientific literature. Spherics can affect people, and that is EHS. Again, it's just known by another name, but that's what that is. Um, and moon cycle, particularly in women, they may have an increase in their sensitivity premenstrually. Now, this is really key to the diagnosis. If this is EHS, then when the electromagnetic exposure is taken away, those symptoms need to get better. Now, this is more complex than it sounds, though, because we can have uh, other components like chemicals activating the same pathways. So when you're assessing, um, that there are very scientific ways of trying to do this, and then there are more practical ways, which is just you get them, we'll talk about this in management, to clean up their life, and you see um, with both objective and subject parameters, subjective parameters, if they're improving. This is a really interesting one that I want to mention because, again, it helps to understand unique features of EHS, body hotspots. So all of you will know that if you're out in ionizing UV radiation too long, you get sunburned skin, and it's hypersensitive for a while afterwards to any kind of stimulus. I believe this something similar is happening in deeper tissues with people with EHS who've had point location exposures, so like a hand on a mouse or a temple with a phone. Um, initially, it just hurts when they have that one exposure, but if it's not managed, then they will start to feel much more distant whole body exposures in that one hotspot place, as though the tissue has become hypersensitive. And we have some mechanisms that fit and can explain that, which is, is useful. Sympathetic overactivity or, or burnout um, later on down the line if it's not managed. Fight and flight upregulation is a strong component of EMF, and we can see this replicated in animal studies as well. If it's not managed, that can lead to adrenal burnout. So you can bring out some of those features in the history by asking. Unusual factors in terms of relief. Um, you've, you guys already talked a bit about grounding. Bathing probably a form of grounding, really, but um, I think is one of the things that some people get instant relief from, even if it's just a shower. Moving. Some people might say to you, I need my wife to drive me around the block in the car and just keep driving and keep driving, and this is going to sound crazy. Um, and uh, it has to be a car who that, that they're not reacting to, so it's often an older car um, that they haven't become sensitized to. Now, the reason they might say this, and it's, it's unusual, but it clinches the history, is because um, EMF sensation is not time-locked. It's not like seeing a light go on. There's a, a lag between the exposure and the, 
and the conscious sensation of it. And that lag changes from person to person. Now, if you can outrun the conscious sensation, then you don't develop symptoms. So for, if people go fast, it's usually when they're in an urban area where they can't escape. But if they move fast enough, they never develop a sensory reaction to a single field. So they can feel relief even for a short time. And shielding, obviously, some people might have tried shielding the device or themselves, and they say they feel better, and that helps you too. Uh, failure of shielding doesn't include, exclude this diagnosis, just to be clear. Um, and regression of symptoms in the reverse order they required. I already mentioned that. Some pitfalls that I, I worry are putting doctors off, family doctors hear patients say some of these things, and this might make them think, Oh, no, that can't, that can't be possible. So let's just cover some of those. Um, the multi-systemic nature I've mentioned, that's what we would expect. That's exactly what we'd expect. Extremely weak field triggers. So batteries in a remote control or an airplane quite a way away. These have fields that we can detect. Um, they, airplanes have radar that you, you can detect with very crude meters, actually, far less sensitive than the human body. That is not something that should make you discount their story. White noise obfuscation is a term that I've created. It's the best one I could think of for what's happening here. Somebody might say that in their very low EMF environment, if somebody walks in with a phone, they feel it immediately and it hurts. And then their partner says, this has got to be a load of rubbish because I just took her to Los Angeles and she was okay. She couldn't feel any phones. I call this white noise obfuscation. What's happening there is in a very pure, clean environment with a clear signal, people can have quite a profound reaction to that. When they're taken into a space where there's a huge amount of different EMFs that are changing all the time, a bit like moving in the car, they can't sense things as clearly and they can have a sort of relief period, but usually what happens is they just build up with global ill health and they can become a lot more unwell with time. Psychiatric manifestations, this is a bit of a can of worms, but um, uh, high stage EHS, left unmanaged, especially for longer periods, can create psychiatric symptoms. And uh, Martin Paul's paper on this has already been mentioned earlier. Um, we, we have mechanisms that will explain this, and the way this should be treated is in a low EMF, low, low chemical environment, not with a lot of the classic psych psychiatric therapies that actually could damage those patients' health. Um, but as a sort of sideline to that, this group may have some quite unusual beliefs and potentially be quite paranoid. But in, in what is actually, if you look at their life and what's happening to them, it, extremely justifiable. Um, they're being made genuinely unwell. Most people don't believe them. And the thing that's making them unwell is everywhere. So it, it, it creates some, some secondary psychological problems that actually are, are kind of fair enough. Um, when I assess severity, to be honest, I usually just use a standard VAS, uh, visual scoring system, and um, I've, I use one to three, mild, moderate, severe, but then I use that to uh, help me stage, and I, I've put my name on this because I don't want to uh, mislead anyone into thinking this is some kind of validated global staging system for EHS, it isn't. <laughs> I put it together for my own use in terms of research in order to try and have some kind of standardization and look at where patients were and where they were going. Um, and um, so stage one, usually mild symptoms, they often haven't noticed the triggers themselves, they might not know, but, um, but changing, dropping F F EMF levels makes them better. So they were probably in stage one, you can say that. And they usually made no lifestyle changes themselves until it's been suggested. Stage two, we get some of the more moderate symptoms and they may have severe, and usually they're identifying triggers now because as the, as the symptoms get stronger, the distance to the device normally um, is more obvious as well, and they start to implement lifestyle changes. And then stage three has to include very severe symptoms, severe lifestyle changes, and um, stage four is a reversal and remission where actually an appropriate management plan has been implemented and we start to move back down down the scaling. Um, examination will usually be normal, but I would suggest that in stages two and three, that's where you're most likely to see something if there is anything to see. You might see some allergic stigmata, asthenic stigmata, autonomic instability signs of, and you might want to do some adjunctive testing to verify that. Skin rashes, hypersensitivity, photosensitivity. Venous dilatation and lymphadenopathy, I would say, is quite late, actually. That would suggest quite a late stage of EHS. But you would hope for all of these potential external signs to resolve um, if it properly managed when you get to stage four. 
And the absence of any clinical findings on examination is not a reason at all to rule out EHS. As I mentioned, it's not normally present. Um, diagnostic coding uh, is different in different countries, but I just um, point out the Europa um, document 2016 guideline I think is really excellent. I think it's really useful. Professor Bob Pom here today was one of the authors on that. Um, and they recommend this coding, but I think um, this is moving a bit more quickly. And ICD-11 already have something that I think is useful. Um, I also have a slide which uh, I can't show you today, but we can perhaps add in later on showing an American billable coding, um, thanks to Elizabeth, um, which is perhaps more practically useful for you guys. Um, medical history and exam is our clinical point of diagnosis. So once you've completed that, that's where you decide. Am I diagnosing EHS? Am I not? Do I need a bit more time to decide? And all of those are reasonable. But then I would suggest this is a useful flow. So at that point, you write your thoughts in the notes. Diagnosis, this, that, or need more time. Then you consider adjunctive testing. But these cannot make or break your diagnosis. I want to be clear about that. Uh, and if anyone disagrees with that, I'd love, I'd love to hear that because it's important for me to know. But I think uh, n we have no tests at the moment that can ch make or break a diagnosis. It's on history. So the kinds of adjuncts you might consider I'm going to go into in a moment. Um, at the same time, of course, you have to investigate for other pathology. And for example... Uh, a person's headaches might be caused by EHS, but they might also have a brain tumor. And given that we're thinking at the moment these two things are potentially both caused by EMF, of course we need to look for them both at the same time. And actually, I raise this now because this is a really important point. Um, these are the kind of research questions and answers that we desperately need um, because this is very important. Are people with EHS who have headaches at more risk of EMF-related brain tumors? Are they at less risk if they're allowed to avoid we don't know the answer to that. I bring in here also consent to research because in my opinion, any test which uh, involves radiation or chemical exposure which could credibly make their condition worse and is not going to make or break a diagnosis and is not going to change management must be considered very, very carefully because we could do further harm. So you need consent. It needs to be made clear that's a research tool and that, yes, we want to know these things, but people shouldn't be engaging in testing like that unless they understand that it's for research purposes and actually it's not going to affect their health. Or it could affect their health, but in a negative way. Um, and I mentioned, uh, well, we'll come on to this in a moment. Um, EMF surveillance and dosiometry, thank you so much to uh, the guys who presented earlier on uh, surveying because this is massively important. So is building biology. Doctors can't do the work to fix this, but those groups can. And um, so huge thanks to them. And then a management plan, which is all-encompassing and multidisciplinary. Blood testing principles have been beautifully um, gone through by Professor Belpom in terms of some of his examination of oxidative status and depletion of antioxidants. So I'm not going to go into this in any detail. And there are lists and lists of blood tests from various groups. This needs to be tailored to your patient. And a lot of you guys are already experts in how to choose these. But broadly speaking, we're interested in oxidative status because we think uh, this is playing an etiological role in EHS immunological status, inflammatory markers, blood chemistry, um, mitochondrial status, particularly in those that have a, a more CFS, chronic fatigue type picture, um, and of course, continuously differential diagnostic screening for comorbidity. I want to quickly mention the lymphocyte sensitivity test because um, this is very important, it possibly may, be, may turn out to be. Um, this is looking at voltage-gated calcium channels allowing calcium influx into cells when, they are, when lymphocytes are exposed to chemical toxins. And it can be shown that if you add into that an electromagnetic field, just household low frequency in this country, 60 hertz, that can potentiate that reaction, which may give us this bridge between why we're seeing MCS and EHS connected. And this is being used uh, experimentally as a diagnostic tool for EHS. And there are some publications pending. Um, it's not something that we can justify on a large scale yet. It's not fully validated, but I think it's really, really interesting. 
And then there are lots of other tests that I know are already being done in environmental clinics. Um, I'm so glad that uh, Gunnar Hauser is here. Uh, you'll be hearing about his functional MRI scanning. Again, something is a research tool. We need to consent and understand the potential harm for it, but actually could massively help us to understand more of the functional aspects of what is happening in the brains of people with EHS. Um, in honor and memory of Dr. Ray, I, I really want to say something about provocation studies. Um, these have been going on on some level for a very long time, and um, so perhaps starting with a Leyden jar where um, you uh, created a big static charge back in the 1700s and 1800s, and then sometimes a lady discharged that through a kiss called the electric kiss. So people have been playing around with electricity for ages, and if you look back through the documentation where people started having fun with electricity, loads of them developed EHS, and they've written about it in lots of different forms. Um, and so we had these provocations that were unknowing or unscientific, but then it took a more scientific form, thanks to pioneers like William Ray, who published this in, I think it was 2009, and um, really important, he showed uh, in double-blind situation that people could identify these fields with a negative reaction. And then he took out the subsection of positive responders and tested them more thoroughly and more carefully with their trigger frequencies and had, I think, a 100% response rate. So. A message I have here, which is controversial, because not uh, there's a lot of failed provocation studies, and that has been the underpinning defense for the nocebo theory. Now, I've said the nocebo theory is wrong, and the reason that there are a preponderance of failed provocation studies is because they have had appalling methodology. So what I did in order to try and explain this to people is I put together a set of criteria that, from my knowledge of EHS, I thought were essential to even give a, a provocation study a chance of showing EHS. Some pre-test conditions during the test and post-test. And I want to be very clear about something else. This is not ethical. It's not ethical to provocation test in order to diagnose this condition. I believe that very strongly. However, I have been part of putting these tests together. Why, why would I do that, you all say? Well, it's not ethical that this group of patients can't go to the grocery shop or the garage without being provocation tested. So people are begging me to do these tests. I say to them, it's not ethical. You don't need it. Your diagnosis is based on history and exam. But this can be a gold standard methodology for proving their condition if it's done correctly. So it's the patient's choice they have to understand that it, the process is damaging their health, but the outcome can bring them better protection. Um, I distilled the important points down to 24 points, um, and then I uh, was able to rate studies and again, again um, give a, a way of standardizing, looking at a provocation study methodology, and the truth is they're all appalling. <laughs> um, but there are, there are a few that, um, that have shown good results, despite actually not optimal methodology. Um, now, I, I need to get into management because um, really, so the key take home messages for diagnosis is actually in your toolbox. All you need is a pen and paper and your normal examination. That is it. And general practitioners need to uh, either come to conferences like this and learn or appraise themselves by re reading the literature. And they are the front line. They need to be supporting patients. And they are, they are allowed to make this diagnosis once they feel well read. I think that's perfectly reasonable. Um, and then when it comes on to management, there's a, it, this is frustrating for us as, as physicians. We want, we want to give them something. It, we want it to be our role to fix them. That's why we trained, right? That's why we get paid. Um, and we can't do all of this. Actually, a lot of it is general advice. So um, I devised the A to H's because of my background in trauma. So we use ABCs in trauma because like children, in times of stress, we need a framework. And actually, it really helps. These simple mnemonics really help. So I reverted to my emergency room self and thought, right, I want a structure. And I came up with this about 10 years ago. And the truth is I haven't really added to it. But if you guys think of valuable things to add, please tell me, because I will. Um, a is for avoidance. And there is no substitute for this, in my opinion. This is the healthiest and safest way to manage this condition uh, in a sensible fashion physiologically. Um, then B uh, and two H's is all about optimizing health. And that is where you guys come in because that's what you're experts in. Um, so 
in the name of A, and I'm going to spend a very short time on this only because other people are covering it, but I am a member of a group we've set up in England that we've called IGNIR, um, which have produced guidelines which are based on the Europa document, the 2016 guideline that I mentioned. These give numerical values where um, you can take one of the meters that you saw earlier, a fairly middle-of-the-road uh, meter, and that can be used um, to measure someone's home and see whether or not it fits into those guideline criteria. Now, the truth is we've never found a level be which, below which we can say it's 100% safe. But we've come up with these biologically-based guidelines based on a peer-reviewed document and then tried to translate them to be practically useful to guys like you, even a restaurant owner or a GP surgery manager, so that in any space you can try to make that space uh, reasonable with reasonable sanitation for a patient with EHS. And um, when you, if you go to the website and have a look at this, there'll be advice on practical ways, very simple layman's terms of how to reduce exposure. And my group, FIO, have also done some trifold leaflets to make this really simple that you can literally give to your patient as well for them to take home. I want to, on avoidance, briefly mention uh, that for extremely sensitive patients, they need extreme avoidance. And so you might need to give them a high level of advice, which again, I'm going to try and make a leaflet for this, but um, things you might not think of. And I agree totally with turning circuit breakers off, partic particularly at night, but actually for some of these groups, they really shouldn't be around low frequency power at all, particularly including sleep. And there are various solutions like gas-powered fridges, freezers, demand switches, um, non-EMF cooking and heating. Primitive camping is what some of the most sensitive groups are forced to in order to regain health. And um, I'm deeply concerned about those groups. I'm sure they exist here as well as back home. And they now have a situation where they have a serious medical condition that could be making them very, very unwell on a physical level. They have lost their social network. They have no medical support. They cannot go and get food. And they might have extremes of temperature to confront, as well as issues with clean water. And so this is an emergency. For this patient group, this is an emergency situation. Um, with avoidance, I must say, of course, because we, uh, we know similar pathways are at play, you must avoid chemical exposures as well. Even in those who are not convinced they're that chemically sensitive, this is sensible to optimize their recovery fast, um, including excitotoxins that might fuel the nitric oxide cycle, um, and especially things that might interplay with the NMDA receptors. Um, think about uh, e exercise exertion of those with CFS symptoms and PSD patients, psychological stresses that can fuel that same cycle and push their fight and flight nervous system. Mold, radon gas, other sources of EMF that you might have not have thought of. That is all part of avoidance. Optimizing resilience, I'm going to whiz through really fast. Um, but I'm going to try and touch on things that are specifically EMF related. Modern AC and heating systems can generate uh, a, a change in ionization in the air, which can be unhealthy and provoke symptoms of EHS, which have been seen with desert winds, for example, as well. Um, so natural a negative iron air, and I'm not advocating negative iron generators, actually. Um, cognitive care, C, cannot be underestimated. I've already mentioned that we don't want to push the fight and flight nervous system of these people. It will make their physical symptoms worse. But there's a caveat here that I feel quite passionately about. CBT can be a really useful form of therapy, and it can definitely help people manage stress. What it must not be used for, and I believe this is negligent medically to use it in this way, is to tell these patients not to be frightened of their phone. Their phone is not possibly causing them any harm. To tell them their Wi-Fi cannot possibly be causing their symptoms, because that is how this has been used in the past. That is wrong. It's scientifically unjustified. Using Psychological therapies for stress management, excellent. Using it to give an inappropriate and un inaccurate um, picture of, of what's happened to them health-wise, that is not okay. Neural retraining and biofeedback techniques, I think, have huge promise and are really interesting. And again, to help people take the edge off the additional potential reaction from um, the understandable anxiety of their situation. Dental care, we've already talked about mercury amalgams. If people are going to have them extracted, just a mercury-aware dentist who takes the maximal precautions and consider chelation following, especially if there's evidence of mercury toxicity on provocation. 
Exercise, uh, be careful in uh, CSF patients, you might want ergometry, but in general you can fit this in with lots of other points in my A to H's to optimize health. And this is all kind of really common sense at this point. I'm not going to go into food, a lot of you will be more of an expert than I am, but antioxidant rich, you know, and, and organic, so to avoid some of these chemical triggers. Grounding, we've talked about. Um, I advocate water bathing in particular, but uh, on healthy ground, that can work as well. Hydration, you don't want to over or under hydrate. People can get a bit obsessive about it. I also advocate glass bottles, spring water, as I think one of the previous uh, medical professionals did. Um, sleep is really essential. So I mentioned circadian rhythm breakdown. This can become very severe. And um, we know that electromagnetic fields can act as zeitgeibers, a bit like light, which is an electromagnetic field, and disorientate your circadian rhythm. This must be fixed if you're really going to help people with EHS. And I've got a long list of things to maximize sleep optimization, particularly for those with EHS. But again, the number one thing in the bed space is still avoidance first. And then um, try and do everything else you can to make that space good. And that list for sleep will be going on my website for fire as well. And it's in your pack anyway. Sunlight is another electromagnetic field. Helps us make vitamin D, which we know, thanks to Professor Belpom, is often low in these patients. Um, and people with severe HS are often naturally phobic of blue light. Fascinating, because a lot of these people have no idea about the published literature showing that that switches off melatonin. Their instincts are trying to protect their body. And um, so, yes, keep away from blue light. Any kind of artificial, particularly fluorescent or blue-white LEDs, especially in the evening. Sauna was a practice of will, a billion rays, I know. Um, and uh, I, all I would say is please uh, make it a, a no EMF and a very low chemical sauna if you're going to use that for toxin excretion. Following the A2Hs, I'd say if you get to the bottom and the patient's still sick or the person's still sick, go back to the top and start again before you move on because there's always more that you can optimize in there. But things to consider when you've optimized that program, nutritional supplements and uh, particularly when you've identified deficits. Immunotherapy, and there's a new pa paper out um, which uh, wasn't assessed as part of the continuing med medical education, so I couldn't put it in. It was just published literally last week, but um, we're going to have it available for anyone who's interested. It's showing that immunotherapy can reduce calcium influx into cells for the multiple chemical sensitivity component in particular. And um, that's actually very, very important and useful because if you can reduce MCS um, reactions, overall that will help desensitize the body and may help in treatment with EHS. Um, chelation only with a professional, please, somebody who's really uh, well qualified to uh, assess chelation if you feel that's necessary. And pharmacology, um, well... Um, please don't be misled by this slide, because I do not advocate pharmacology for treatment of EHS. Absolutely not. I reserve this when everything else has failed, and if a person says, I don't care about the exposure, I, need to, I have no choice, I, I'm going to be exposed, and I cannot cope with the symptoms, then of course we have tools as medical doctors in our arsenal to deal with that, and you need to choose the ones that most suit your patients. But please be aware, they are a chemically sensitive group. They're highly likely to be the ones that have the high side effect profile. So I'm not advocating this. I'm just pointing out that, of course, as a last line management, we have those available to us for masking symptoms. Prognosis. Recovery time depends on the stage of staging of EHS and the duration that somebody has been unwell. And, um, but complete reversal, on an optimistic level, complete reversal is absolutely possible, even for very severe patients and with potentially no fancy medical intervention, purely a no chemical, low EMF space. Um, however, and this is a serious however, this is a big caveat, most people cannot return for any length of time to a highly toxic environment that made them ill in the first place. They can push their boundaries out, but usually it's only a matter of time if they try to go back to the same destructive lifestyle that they will develop the same symptoms. So it's a management process, but it can be extremely successful and bring people back to what they perceive as a perfect state of health. And you need to know what your patient wants because they might not want what you think they should want. Now, I'm rounding up here, and um, I just want to point out, we've touched on the other end points, including cancer, and uh, a year after the WHO designated this as a group to be carcinogen, they said, 
We're also predicting a tidal wave, I quote from them, of cancer. And we're seeing that, you know, in pediatric populations as well, in certain types of cancers, we're seeing the beginning of this. Um, and this brings me back to one of my very first slides. Um, so there was a reason that I told you specifically about the Mokan tribe when I talked about adaptive states, and I used them as an example. I find this group really interesting because when the tsunami hit the coast there, there were two groups in the water. Well, there, there were this group who live on the water, and there were the Burmese boatmen, and they also live on the water. They fish um, for a commercial interest, for a living. But the Burmese boatmen all died. And a journalist and an interviewer went to a Mokan tribe member and said, what, why? They are as connected with the ocean as you are. They live there too. Why did they all die and you all survived? And here's the reply. They were looking for squid. They were not looking at anything. They saw nothing. They looked at nothing. They don't know how to look. I found that really fascinating because the Mokan tribe had used their, their connection with the ocean to notice a lot of highly sensitive issues, some changes like dolphin swimming deeper and uh, crustaceans rising. So they got out. They perceived and they processed the sensory cues that led to their survival. I hope um, the, the irony and the, and the importance both of that does not escape you because as this tsunami comes, you have to decide who you want to be. And I'm not saying, do you want to become electrosensitive? Of course, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, let's look at all the layers of this and what the science is telling us and interpret that on a, on a, a proper, broad, meaningful scale in a wider interpretation of health. So in conclusion, the health threat from EMF is real and it affects all forms of life, not just humans and all all groups of humans, not just those with EHS. Sensitivity to it could be perceived as an acute adaptive state that produces deliberately an avoidance reaction. But if people cannot avoid, very serious illness can ensue, and that can be life-threatening. EHS is currently a clinical diagnosis. Any practitioner who has appraised themselves of the new literature and understands this subject should be able to diagnose it. We do need this added in its own right to ICD-11, and, and thank you so much again to Professor Belpom, who I believe is in the process of that, and we've got some positive reasons to think that's going to happen. But there is currently a, a global crisis for this group. It is an emergency right here and right now. And um, optimizing general health from your position as medical practitioners, diagnosis is massively important. Yes, it, it won't fix them, but it gives them a huge amount of, of support, so the social support they desperately need, the validation of what's happening to them, which is actually a huge role that only you can give them. And then advice on avoidance, even if it's just a leaflet, very, very useful, or referring them to a, building, a good building biologist. And then optimizing general health, that's what you guys are specialists in. Do that, it's a very important role, don't trivialize it. Um, and then uh, watching trend. So some of the adjunctive testing, some of the types of blood testing that I mentioned, if you have identified with an adjunct that there's a problem, you can watch that trend and see if your management plan is working. So you might see reversal of oxidative stress or some of the other markers that we're using. Reversal, full reversal of VHS is possible in a low EMF, low chemical environment, and that can be sustained back into a harsher environment for a period of time, even for very, very seriously unwell patients. And the last thing that I want to say is sometimes when I give talks to schools, groups, or parents, they can feel massively overwhelmed. They see this, you know, in, at the end of my talk, they feel like they're sat under that wave themselves. And I point out, please don't feel overwhelmed because think about what that wave is. Um, whether you perceive that as, as illness or just the EMF exposures themselves, every molecule of the water in that wave is a consumer. It's you, it's us. And actually, it's, it's not something we're totally out of control of. And in fact, you, um, as consumers, you have a, a, a way to state if you want change, but more importantly, as, as medical practitioners, you can massively influence the way this is going, massively. I think medical doctors and health practitioners in general hugely hold a valuable key to moving forward, and we've needed you guys for a long time. So this kind of medically accredited program, 
Thank you so much to the organisers of this and to William Ray for his vision in putting it together. This is exactly what we need to start changing to a healthier future. Thank you so much.